Okay, this is Political Science 101, Intro to American Government, Chapter 1, American Government and Civic Engagement. This is our first lecture, okay? And I'm Amanda Vickers, and your instructor for this class. What is government? That's the first thing we're going to talk about. So government is a means by which a society organizes itself and how it allocates authority in order to accomplish collective goals and provide benefits that the society as a whole needs. I chose this picture here that says this is America, where you vote if you please, where the privileges of democracy belong to all people equally, where your government is your servant, not your master. This is your America. Keep it free. I think it's important because what you're going to learn in this class is about American government and how we're different than other countries. What makes us different than China? What makes us different than Russia? Why are people dying at the, the southern border trying to come over here? And it is that freedom that, you know, that this picture discusses. It's what makes us, you know, that, that example. So we're going to learn more about that this term. So we also got to know what politics is. I'm sure we've all heard of the term politics. You know, you either love it, you hate it, you deal with it. You know, we we have to know what exactly it means, though. So it refers to the process of gaining and exercising control within a government for purposes of setting and achieving particular goals, especially those related to the division of resources within a nation. If you do a you know an in-depth look at the different parties, right, the two major parties especially, you'll see that they each have different thoughts, especially related to where funding should go, you know, what should be happening in the country, things like that. And you can actually see this term of what is politics play out by seeing the differences in the parties. But we will be spending a week on parties later on this term. So we gotta know, you know, this, this lecture is gonna be a lot of terms because we have to learn the different terms about different types of, of governments and economic systems to understand what we have in the United States. So certain forms of government are often linked to an economic system. So think of an example of the government would be a democracy. Now, that's government by citizens, and it's often associated with capitalism, which is an economic system in which uh, the means of production are controlled by individuals who invest in business and industry. So the United States is a very much a capitalistic you know, economy. Now, socialism advocates public or government control over the means of production. So that's government ownership in pretty much everything. You can look to countries like, um, like in Canada, they have socialized medicine. In England, they have socialized medicine. In a certain parts of Europe, there is a socialist government. And a lot of times socialism is directly related to communism, which, you know, you can see in countries like China and Russia. So then you have this idea of an oligarchy. That is a form of government in which a small class of political and economic elites control the government. You'll see this um, in different parts of, you know, some, some parts of the Middle East, some parts of Asia. So just different terms to know. So we got to know the idea of goods in a capitalistic eco e economic system, right? So we are in the United States a representative democracy, meaning that we elect representatives who carry out, hypothetically carry out our wishes. I say hypothetically because it doesn't always work that way. You know, in the perfect world, they represent us, right? And that's how we do democracy in this country, or you know, at least at the federal level. So in that we have the capitalist economic system. And that's where private businesses produce and sell most consumer goods and services and get a profit on these private goods. So, you know, I need a new TV. I don't go down to the city of Riverside and say, hey, city of Riverside, I'm going to buy a TV from you, right? I go to Best Buy. I go to Target. I go to look on Amazon. Different types of things. Now, there are some goods or services such as public safety and education that the government provides these public goods. Now. An argument can be made, they're, they're made at a base level. For example, they have private elementary schools, private you know, middle schools, private high schools, and private colleges. So, you know, that's something that, that could be argued. But here, like at Mount San Jacinto, we are in a 
public school, a public college. So that would be a public good. Now, you know, the government also protects common goods. So common goods are things like water and other natural resources. And so it's in the benefit to protect all, protect it for all of us, right? So we have, you know, we have some, in some areas you have a water management district, you know, that takes care of that and others, you know, it's just the county, but it is all protected. Um, for purposes of exams, when we have our exam in this class, you know, pay attention to things that are bolded. That's just a hint. The example here is a ambulance in Chicago owned by the Chicago Fire Department. So your tax dollars pay for emergency services. And this is an example of that. So in case you don't know, your property taxes and sales tax are what fund public safety. So when they see lower um, levels of people paying their property taxes and lower levels of people purchasing goods in the stores that are subject to sales tax, it actually you know defunds your public safety agencies. So here's this interesting chart about different types of goods, right? So it's something that I think is kind of important to kind of know. You know, it starts out with these non-excludable goods here, and Everyone has access to these non-excludable goods. No one can be excluded, such as fish in the ocean. Think about how big the ocean is. You can't really say, hey, Jack, you know, we don't like you as society, so you can't fish. No, it's impossible. Um, fresh water, right? Fresh water comes out of our faucets. They don't, unless we decide to be like China, which I will post a video about that. Um, you can't restrict people's access to fresh water. So then public goods. Public goods are public education. The mail, national security. If, you know, we're protecting someone from a terrorist, a city from a terrorist attack, we don't just, we just don't, you know, protect the taxpayers. We protect everybody. You know, my comment about China is in China, they have this social credit system where they actually, the government controls the money and based on how you rate in the credit system is how you can access um, public transportation and, and other types of public goods. I'll post a couple of YouTube videos so you guys can kind of see. Um, I think it's alarming and it's something we wanna ensure does not happen here. Then we have excludable goods. So not everyone has access to these goods. So, you know, cell phones, cars, homes, right? You have to purchase it. Um, this is also considered a rivalrous good and where only one person can use the good or service at any given time. Um, then you have toll goods. So these are things also that you're paying for. Private schools, turnpikes, cable TV. I'd argue the, 90, the 91 express lanes, right? Not everyone is a part of them. So these are considered non-rivalrous goods because a lot of people can use them at, at the same time. Okay, so this is some good vocabulary just to kind of have. So democracy, what is democracy? It's a form of government in which political power influence over institutions, leaders and policies is controlled by the people. So the United States is a representative democracy. That doesn't mean that we all have to go and govern and take our, you know, what we do is we elect representatives who are supposed, ideally supposed to represent us at the you know state and federal level. And government policy and, and votes are established by those people. So there is a check on the power, you know, of these people because we we may not reelect them, right? If they're not doing a good job for us. Then you have the idea of a direct democracy where people participate directly in government decisions instead of relying on elected representatives. I would argue to you that you could see this in um, in a way you know, in school boards right now, uh, cities when they have town hall meetings um, at the lower level. Yes, you know you do have school boards where people are being elected, but right now you also have a lot of parents, especially in Marietta and Temecula area, who are going to the school board and they're actually effectuating change based on you know objections to certain types of curriculum. So I would argue to you that is a version of direct democracy. 
Here's an example of direct democracy. These residents um, of Boxborough, Massachusetts, gather in a local hotel to discuss issues affecting their town. So it's like a town meeting and everyone has the ability to, to participate. That's direct democracy. So then we gotta know some other terms. So monarchy. Um, in a monarchy, there's a single, uh, usually hereditary ruler holding political power. Many monarchies um, limit the monarch's power with some form of representative government, such as parliament. England is the best example. King Charles became the king after his mom, Queen Elizabeth, died. And he is the ruler of political power. He holds political power. But England also has a parliament who parliament helps run the actual government. So then you have totalitarian governments. And that's where the state is controlled by a single leader or a small group of elites. Um, and they control every aspect of citizens' lives. I mean, an example here would be Iran, where Iran has the president and... They also have this council of elders who run everything. You know, there is no democracy there. Okay, now we're going to the second part of our lecture. So who governs? You know, can, can just a regular person govern? Or does it have to be somebody, you know, who's rich and elite? Uh, we're gonna talk about elitism, pluralism, and trade-offs. So this idea of elitism elitism versus pluralism. Yeah, within a representative democracy, the elite theory of government holds that a small group of elites control power, while other citizens have little or no influence. Then we have the pluralist theory of governments that holds that competing interest groups influence the government and hold political power. So citizens may influence the government by becoming involved with groups that share similar interests and engaging with their representatives at a local, state, or national level. I think this is kind of an interesting idea. You know, running a political campaign is not cheap. I have looked went to a campaign school a few months ago, and they told me that you shouldn't even consider running if you don't know 100 people that can give you $1,000. And I mean, I know 100 people, and I love 100 people, but I don't know 100 people that are willing to give me that much money. Um, I'm sure they have other things to do with their thousands of dollars, right? So talking more about elitism, this shows, you know, Daddy Bush, Baby Bush, President Clinton and President Trump and Obama, and that they all went to Ivy League schools. Similar, like if you look at like the Supreme Court, right? They're all going to come from top tier schools. So this kind of goes into the idea that we do have elitis elitism in our government. So we have this idea called the trade-off perspective. And that acknowledges that there's competing interests, whether elitists or pro that vie for government influence. These competing interests produce government actions and policies and are influenced by a series of trade-offs or compromises. A lot of our gov governing in America is done through trade-offs and compromises. You know, that's why when we have bills, sometimes our bills will be, you know, a thousand pages long. Because if I go to Senator Jack and say, Senator Jack, I need money for, you know, to house military veterans in Southern California, and he's trying to get money for a railroad, well, I might agree to sign off on that railroad if he agrees to sign off on my funding for military vets, right? You know, we're having to look and see. Yeah, you know, another example of trade-offs is here is the idea of fracking. You have this public announcement here for a meeting regarding fracking, showing what, you know, benefits it has for the community and whatnot. And then you have this person here who is, you know, protesting it. So, you know, the government there has to actually come to a conclusion based on, you know, the competing interests as to what the best way to move forward would be. Okay. Then this is the last part of our lecture. And that's on engagement in democracy. I want to say last part of the lecture is the last part for chapter one. So I've broken them down by chapter just because I don't want to commit death by PowerPoint or death by lecture to you guys. I figure if I could break it into better chunks, you're more likely to watch them all and more likely you, know, you can stop and have breaks and whatnot. So that's the 
that's my thought process for that. So this engagement in democracy. So traditionally, citizens engage in democracy through membership and advocacy on behalf of small groups, such as churches, local labor unions, and other groups. Today, you know, today everyone carries a computer with them via their phone, and it may leave citizens with less time to be active members of a civic organization. Um, you know, I don't even at my level, I don't know a lot of people who are parts of different groups. Citizens join larger national organizations, and you know. They'll play a small role, like they'll donate their twenty dollars a month, but they don't actually go to like the meetings. They don't go to the luncheons. Yeah, you know, I went to a Riverside County Republican Women's meeting a few months ago, and I was sad to say that I was the youngest person there in the building. Um, most of the people there were my grandma's age. You know, we don't really put a lot of importance on you know, getting involved in the community and things like that, which is something that I think needs to happen. I encourage you guys to find an, an idea that, an idea or a cause that you really are passionate about and see what needs to be done, you know, to help bring that about. Because, you know, you need to get involved. I chose a picture of a jury panel about getting involved because one of your civic duties as an American is, is jury duty, right? Because it's like, there's this idea of social capital that we all got to come together to work towards a common goal. And civic engagement, that increases the power of you as the individual to influence government policies and action. I've even gotten so far as to hear from um, senators that if you call and you want to complain about something or you want to make your voice heard on an issue, that they'll check the voting register to see how often you voted. I really hope that, you know, at the, by the end of this class, that if you haven't registered to vote already, that you are registered to vote because I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I think it's just important for people to vote. Um, you know, part of our representative democracy requires an informed citizenry to, to vote for candidates and advocate for their desired policies along with other forms of engagement. This is how we keep our democracy because we need people to vote. Other pathways of civic engagement, um, you know, protesting from, you know, watch the news, stay informed about current events, you know, voting, giving a political campaign, contacting your elected representatives, um, find these groups that are, are have a, the same passion as you, you know, and volunteer or fundraise for them, register people to vote. You know, joining protester marches, boycotting businesses, people have been boycotting Budweiser, Target, you know, different ways that you can participate at all different levels, especially depending on your comfort. So we have these factors of engagement on presidential elections. Um, about two thirds of Americans took some kind of political action in 2008, which was a presidential election year. So it, it has been noted that in presidential election years, that's when people mostly vote. You hear, people, you hear people say, I'll vote when it counts, or I'll vote in the big elections. Um, that's an example of this. So that could be, you know, signing petitions, which we see sometimes um, when you're coming out of the grocery store, people wanting you to sign petitions, or even contributing to a campaign. It could be, you know, having a yard sign, something simple, right? But it still is getting involved. So what causes people to get involved in, in politics, right? You know, their age is a factor. You know, Americans under age 30 are less likely to engage in partisan politics. You know, I'm hoping to help change that. And that's one of the things by teaching these classes is trying to get people excited about politics because it's everywhere. You cannot get away from it. In a 2015 survey by Harvard, more young Americans claimed affiliation with the independent party than Democrats or Republicans. And this study also found that Americans under 30 are less likely to get involved politically, but more likely to engage in civic activities, such as volunteering to provide community services for nonpartisan groups. So I think that's interesting that people, you know, they are willing to come together for their community, but just not based on politics. 
And here's an example. Um, here's sailors from the USS Ronald Reagan after you know horrible fires in California. They help volunteers rebuild houses for Habitat for Humanity. Another one is volunteers feeding people, you know, during the Occupy Wall Street protest. Um, another you know, factor of political engagement is wealth and education. The wealthier and more educated citizens are, the more likely they are to vote. So when you think of other factors that can cause someone to be engaged in politics, so these can be, you know, their family, right? Is their family politically active? Because if mom and dad are likely to be active, so will the kids based on you know, the idea of modeling. Um, incidents that happen in people's personal lives may motivate them to get, go into office. There are a lot of different factors I'd like you to consider. Just kind of sit on that and think about that. Okay, this is the end of our chapter one lecture.